This is going to be an interesting message. Hopefully interactive. So get ready, okay? I might be asking some questions. Um, I'm going to start with a scripture, and then we're going to jump in. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. And many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And Yahweh was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. You guys know where that's from? Acts 2, 42 through 47. So that's kind of the benchmark for what we look at as what a true community should be, right? What the true kingdom community should be. And I guess, first of all, I want to just commend you guys because we are doing some amazing things as a community. Um, There are, you know, times when we've given to people who have need. We're there for, you know, prayer needs, um, we're spending time with each other, lifting each other up, uh, encouraging one another, and all these things are, are happening. And I'm really proud of you guys for doing that. Um, and there's a ton of testimonies. I mean, uh, you know, Megan started the Bible study, you know, community, going out. Dan's been giving of his time. Mike's been giving of his time. Uh, you know, Amy helping prepare for events and, and Christina, you know, talking to our youth and, and just, you know, everyone has something that they're, they're giving to the community. They're giving to the kingdom through the community. And someone asked me, I was, I was talking about this message and that I was going to talk about togetherness and community and this thing. They asked me, well, why are you always so focused on community? It's like everything I do Everything I, I try to do has an element of community in it. Why is that? And I started thinking back, because you know, sometimes we think there's negative things that, that lead, like, well, I can never make it on my own, so I need somebody there with me. And there's, there has been part of that in my past. Um, but at the same time, and I think we could all agree that we, if we look back, we find there's times when we've had that sense of awe when there's community involved, when there's collaboration, when there's um, cooperation. Um, And we've seen signs and wonders. I've seen signs and wonders in those times. So, you know, I don't know. I've even, you know, I've been the one that's been lifted up. I've, I've been the one who's been blessed by lifting somebody up. And all these things, it's community oriented. It's togetherness that really had had the impact in that moment, right? And then I started thinking about my history as a musician. So, you know, you can sing by yourself, and most people can only sing one note at a time. Some people can maybe sing two, I don't know. (laughs) But one one melody, one line is, is beautiful, and it's, it can be expressive, and it can have a certain tone to it. But when you add a second note and a second line, a harmony, it changes the perspective of the entire piece. Imagine a 150-person choir with everybody just letting everything hang out there, just blasting a note. Like It has so much more power than just one, one person. And I've had, I've, so I've experienced that. I've always had a band 
or played music or been in a choir or something where there's multiple people around. And in a choir, you're really relying on the person next to you to sing what they're supposed to sing so that you can, when you sing what you're supposed to sing, that it blends perfectly. And then it creates an atmosphere based on the, the tonality and all that, right? But you wouldn't have that if you didn't have harmony. You wouldn't have that if you didn't have a hundred people, right? So, again, you know, Megan, Dan, Mike, Kathy opening, you got, you know, and Glenn, you guys opening your house. All these things are pieces that, that bring out the community in all of us. <laughs> so that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about together togetherness, the power of unity. We're going to talk about a Hebrew word called kahal, which many of you probably have heard before. Um, and so before we do that, let's pray. The Heavenly Father, we all come before you um, unified in spirit, unified in mind. Um, God, I pray that your spirit, your ruach would blow through um, this place, God, that would you would breathe through me and that these words would not be my words, but that they would be your words. And I pray that this wouldn't just be something we hear and it goes in and it goes out and, and then we forget about it. But I pray that this would be um, some seed planting time, something that takes root in each of us that as we um, go about our lives, as we, as we walk out in the world, that, that this would be inside of us. This, this concept of, of kahal and togetherness. So I pray all this in Yeshua's name. Amen. All right. So who, who has heard of the word kahal before? Yeah. yeah, a lot of people, several people. Who has not heard of it? Just the same amount. <laughs> Good. So we're going to try to answer a couple of questions. And as we're going, if you have questions or comments or things, raise your hand, write them down, and maybe we'll talk at the end or whatever. But I want, I want this to be kind of a, you know, a two-way street. We're going to try to answer what is the significance of kahal. Um, we're going to answer the question, are we a modern-day kahal, and are we part of that blessing and promise that goes with that? If we are part of the kahal, then what impact then what impact does that have on us today? Here, Freedom Hill and Dave, Christina, Glenn, Mike, all of us. So, Kahal um, in the Strongs is H6951, if you want to write that down, 6951. And it means four different things. It's translated into four different things. Assembly, company, congregation, and convocation. And the root is the same. It, it, I think it sounds a little bit different, but it's the same spelling. It's kof, uh, hey, lamed. It's also kahal. Uh, but the root means to gather. To gather, right? So really, it's kind of what Yeshua is going to do in the end. He's going to gather the two sticks and he's bringing them together. That's part of, that's part of that. Uh, it's that same concept. Um, so just a little bit about Kof, Hay, and Lamed. Kof is like a sun on the horizon. So like you can, it's just behind the horizon. So you can start to see the dawn. Okay? So it's like the light's just popping up. Um, hay is like re to reveal or revelation. And then Lamed is, is a staff uh, where you can lead. But it also is related to teaching. It also is relating to prodding, because you prod with a staff sometimes too, right? So keep those things in mind as we go forward. So the first instance of Kahal. Um, this is happening right when Jacob is about to go out and get married. He's, gonna, he's literally getting ready to go out, and, and uh, he's going to meet Levan, his uncle, and then he's going to meet uh, Rachel and Leah, <laughs> and that's a whole fun story in and of itself. But this is right as that's at the onset of that. And Isaac, uh, Yaakov's father, is blessing him. And this is what he says. This is Genesis 28, 3 
and 4. And if you want to turn there, I'll, I'll wait a second. So, this, so that's the setup, right? And who is Jacob? Who's Yaakov? He's the patriarchal father of the 12 tribes that we know as Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel, right? Okay, so if you're there, Genesis 28, 3 through 4, may Yahweh bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you that you may become a multitude of peoples. And no, I didn't stutter there. May he also give you the blessing of Abraham to you and to your descendants with you that you may possess the land of your sojournings, which God gave to Abraham. Okay? So that's the first time. And the first time kahal is, is when it says a multitude of peoples. That word multitude is kahal. So, so let's dive in a little bit. First of all, we're talking about, with this blessing, be fruitful and multiply, that you may become a kahal of peoples. Be fruitful and multiply. So where else does that come from? Where else have we heard that? Yeah, Genesis. This is the first blessing that, that Yahweh spoke over Adam and Chava, right? Be fruitful and multiply. Uh, and then why does it say a multitude of peoples? That's L'chahal Amim. Multitude of peoples. Well, it's interesting, right? Because out of Jacob, we know comes 12 tribes, and each one of those tribes becomes a people in and of itself. So now he's saying, you're going to be a multitude of peoples, of people groups. And all these are going to be under one heading, one multitude called Kahal. Okay? And it's also interesting, too, um, because multiple group, multiple people groups kind of suggest like, like this uh, uh, perpetuity. I guess that's the right word. Where it's, I guess, a perpetualness to it. There's, there's going to be more peoples than just the people that's coming from you. And I think that's also why he addresses the descendants. But so, what is the kingdom made of? People, the kingdom is made up of people, okay? So right here we have the onset, the promise of the kingdom that's to come. This is, this is the, the sort of that seed that's planted, that blessing seed that's planted that, that will come forth and come to fruition. And we'll, we'll learn about that in a little bit here. But it also, in this blessing, is talking about a territory. So there's not just people, a kingdom's also made of a territory, Right? You gotta have a place to put the people. You gotta have a land. So the, the the blessing is, may the land of your sojournings where you where you traveled as a foreigner, may you become the possessor, may you become the owner. Um, and he's referring to the land of what? Land of Canaan, right? At this at right now, he's talking about the land of Canaan. So how many people have been to Israel? A lot of people, and I think we have some going in a month, right? Yeah, Nick and Valentina are going to be there over the uh, Passover season, so that's man, what a time to go. <laughs> they would take Mike with. <laughs> that's awesome. Like, yeah, if you need like a personal, you know, minstrel, I could go with you or something. <clears throat> but um, when you guys were there in Israel, did it feel more like home than this does? The land where Abraham sojourned, we are to possess. It's, we're supposed to own that, right? And, well, I, I'll, get, I'll come right back to that. But uh, So let's jump real quick to descendants. Who's the descendants? Who are the descendants? Yeah, somebody said where I was going. We are. Now, obviously, we know there's 12 tribes and, you know, generation after generation to generation. But ultimately, we are a piece of that. You are here because God said this blessing. That's why you're here. It all goes back to this. Well, Isaac's speaking it here. And sometimes I think we forget who we are. 
Sometimes I think we forget that we're part of a kingdom. Or we, we think, oh, we're a part of America, which we are, but that's secondary to what? The kingdom. We should, be, we should know our place and know our part in the kingdom. What's your place? What's, what's the part that you play? Um, and then as you're thinking of descendants and that this is us, this blessing applies to you. So what is God speaking to you? Be fruitful and multiply. What does that mean? Well, we're going to end service earlier so you guys can go home and be fruitful and multiply. No, we're not. <laughs> we're actually staying late for an egg today. But, um, <laughs> so physically, yes, we should be multiplying. And we have a ton of amazing kids. You guys are proving it out. But at the same time, in the kingdom, we also ought to be fruitful in the Spirit and let the fruit of the Spirit multiply not just our power, not just our territory, but also the people that are in the room. And so it's kind of reaching out to the community, right? So these promises and blessings apply to us. Territory, where you... No, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump to right now. Right now, think about, about your life. The territory where you sojourn, you should possess in the spiritual realm. So I don't think this is just for, for that time frame and for Jacob. That's for now. When you, when you walk into Walmart, if you shop at Walmart, let's do it better. When you walk into Mike George's store and you're looking for some beautiful jewelry for your wife or your husband, depending on... <laughs> when you walk in... That territory becomes kingdom territory. When there's a motorcycle shop next door and you're giving a message, you can claim, hey, this is kingdom territory. Why? Because you are part of the kingdom and where you go, you guys know some of the scriptures, right? Wherever you go, wherever your foot touches the ground, that would be you know, claimed for the kingdom. So, a lot of us are walking around kind of accepting the world as it is. I'm just going to go to, the, go to get gas. Oh, I'm just going to go do X, Y, Z. And we should have more boldness with where, who we are in those situations. And when something negative happens, we can say with boldness and confidence, no, this is the kingdom territory right here, right now. I am here. I'm a part of the kingdom. The light is inside me. And... Darkness, you have to flee. So we need to possess the land where we step. Darkness should flee. Revelation should abound. Healing should abound. Love should abound. All these things should abound because you are there. Um, and, and you should, in, like we, I'll use we because it's me too, we should be the influencer. We shouldn't be the influenced. Because the enemy's trying to influence. He wants to influence. He's whispering in your ear. He's, he's gnawing, like gnawing at the door, waiting for an opportunity to pull you, influence you away from what God wants for you. And so we have the power to be on the other side of that. We have the power to influence the people around us to shed light where there might not have been light before. That's in us. We, can, we sang about it. Um, we talked about it. We, you know, the Shamash candle is literally giving light. That's the center candle. That's giving light to the rest of the menorah. And, and we are figuratively the menorah. We're the tree. We're the fruit. But the Shamash candle, Yeshua, is in us. And that's the, that's the first part, right? We share in that light. So that's, that's Genesis. That's the first time we see the word kahal, right? Be fruitful and multiply so that you can become a kahal of peoples, a congregation of peoples, a multitude, an assembly of peoples. Okay? L'chahal amim. Everybody say that. Am I saying it right? L'chahal amim. 
Lechahal Amim. Am is people and Amim is plural. So let's jump to the second. Actually, uh, I'm going to jump down to Genesis 28, 14 and 15 first. Your descendants, who's that? Us. We're part of that group. Will also be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and the south, and in you and in your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. No pressure. (laughs) Behold, I am with you, and I will keep you wherever you go, and will bring you back to this land For I will not leave you until I've done what I've promised you. There's a lot in here. But I wanted to kind of follow up with that whole descendant piece. So what are are we supposed to be as the descendants? A blessing to all the families of the earth. Now some of us are struggling to be a blessing to the body here, right? Or to um, other local bodies, Some of us are struggling to be a blessing to our wife um, or to our friends. But he's literally saying here that through your descendants, he's going to bless everybody. Everybody. That means everywhere you go. Every person you talk to is supposed to be blessed through you. That opens up a lot of possibilities. What's God asking you to do? I think to go back to the question of, of, Why do I want to speak about community all the time? Because there's a lot of potential there that we haven't tapped into. There's a lot of potential. And I think we have to open up our spiritual eyesight first to make ourselves aware that, oh my gosh, when I walk out that door, there might be somebody at the bar across the door, or across the street that's just standing there. That's an opportunity. God wants to bless that person through his descendants. So we need to be aware of these things first, okay? That's why I'm talking about it. And the other thing is, with that, with that awareness, now it's up to you because we really don't want to, we can't manufacture it. You cannot manufacture community. Community is something that just is, it's either in you or it's not. What do I mean? We've all been a part of a community before where we've pledged our lives to each other and we said, oh, I'm, you know, I'm going to always lift you up. I'm always be there for you. And if that was the case, there should be 10,000 people in this room, easy. But there's not. Because some people were trying to manufacture community and others were actually living it. Now, I'm probably preaching to the choir because you guys are here, but... And, and this is not meant to judge anyone. All, the, all I'm saying is we can't manufacture it. It's either in you. It's, it's something maybe that you've got to pray about. It's maybe something that you've got to take home and, and really investigate. Like, what does it mean for me to be a part of Freedom Hill? What does it mean for me to be a part of the kingdom? More importantly, the kingdom. Right? And we have to do it by the Spirit. Like There has to be the spirit of community. Otherwise, this, this won't work. So, it's not really interactive yet, is it? <laughs> um, here's the other interesting thing I thought in, in the Scripture. Uh, you will spread out to the west, east, north, and south. So the interesting thing to me was, when you're obedient... He allows, you to, he allows the kingdom to spread through you. When you're disobedient, you you're still spread out, but you're scattered. So the idea is that we're always going to be spreading out, but is it backed by obedience or is it backed by disobedience? So look at the effect of each. If, if you're obedient, you spread the identity. The kingdom identity is spread out. It's shared. If you're disobedient, you lose your identity according to to Deuteronomy, right? When you're disobedient, you lose your identity. When you spread out from obedience, you multiply. But when you're disobedient, it, it divides you. 
It tears, you, it tears families apart. It tears the kingdom apart. It tore the tribes apart, right? So this, this uh, blessing uh, that we just read in Genesis 28 is actually a redemption of the fall of Adam. So when Adam was disobedient, he was, in a sense, scattered from the garden. He was, he was sent out from the garden, right? But God, right now, is in the process of gathering. So he's redeeming the fall of Adam just right in this one, in this one verse. And I want to suggest that if we're going to advance the kingdom, if we're going to um, be ambassadors, then we have to multiply. We have to spread out. We have to take territory by territory by territory. So, okay, so has this been fulfilled? Did, did what we just read, has that been fulfilled in, in Isaac and Jacob's life? Well, um, this is a promise that Yahweh fulfilled to Jacob through Joseph. Because when, you remember they left because, uh, because of the drought and the famine? And then he, he ends up dying in uh, uh, Egypt, Mitzrayim. And Joseph asked for a leave of absence so he could take his father back to the land, right? That's, that's Genesis 50. The Israelites, he was also talking to the Israelite, Israelites here prophetically as a nation. And then, of course, we just talked about uh, they went uh, to... Egypt, and then he brought them back through Moshe and through Yehoshua back into the land. So he filled, filled it there. And they even left a memorial, incidentally, at um, Gilgal uh, that speaks to the 12 tribes, speaks to Ephraim, speaks to the, the, the lost tribes, which you guys know mostly know that story. But basically, that's the memorial that says, you have access to this land. This is your possession as well. Okay, as descendants. So the other, like in modern uh, times, the Jewish people are returning to the land of Canaan through a process called Aliyah. Many of you are familiar with that. Do we have any Jewish people here? I've got Jewish in me as well. Yeah, we've got some, right? So this, they say if you can, if you can prove your heritage, you can actually move and go to the land. And that's part of this promise as well. But speaking prophetically, this is the, it's also the ingathering that Yeshua is going to do. We're talking about taking the stick of Ephraim and the stick of Judah and bringing them back together and uniting everyone in the land. So that's part of this as well. That's coming. Part of that, I think, is now. I think he's, I think he's got like he's at least reaching for the sticks if he doesn't already have them in his hand. And he's, okay? And you can read about that in Isaiah 11. So this is the second instance of Kahal. All right, is everybody doing okay? Everybody awake? If your neighbor's not, just nudge him. Like, wake up a little bit. Okay, Genesis 35, 10 through 12. Yahweh said to him, so now Yahweh is speaking to Jacob again. Your name is Jacob, Yaakov. You shall no longer be called Yaakov, but Israel shall be your name. Thus he called him Israel. God also said to him, I am Yahweh Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. This is, this is the echo. Be fruitful and multiply a nation and a company of nations shall come from you, and kings shall come forth from you. That's new. The land which I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I will give it to you, and I will give, you the, land, give the land to your descendants after you. So everything is echoed here except for he adds a piece, right? The only person that really truly could add, add that piece is Yahweh himself. Who sets up kings and kingdoms? Only Yahweh. Isaac doesn't have the ability to tell Jacob that you are now a royal bloodline. But God does. God can anoint a king. So, so right here, um, 
What does this do to uh, for us? What does this do for Freedom Hill? What does this do for, for Kathy and Glenn? This is saying now that you are a part of a royal bloodline. You're the descendants, right? If a king is going to come through that, that means that the that, that headship of uh, Yaakov or Israel is kingly. Kingly. So what does that do? That's, that should speak to you. That should speak, oh my gosh, I am a prince. I am a princess. I am a king. I am a queen. Like you have that royal blood in your lineage. And what does he also tell us? You're, you're to be a kingdom of what? Kings and priests. So, how does that affect us? And Laura's always asking me, what can I do with that? What can I do with that? Well, it plays out like this. If someone in this room is annoying you, you've got to remember, that's royalty. You're talking to someone who's royalty that God ordained. God put, put them in, in the line, in the lineage. So it should play out in our res- respect for each other. What else do we read in the New Testament? Esteem each other higher than you esteem yourself. That's part of that, right? That's part of that. So when I come in here, and forgive me, I've probably treated some of you harshly, or I've you know been blunt or standoffish or whatever if I'm doing something, and that's my fault because I should honor you enough to, to think of you as royalty, the royalty that you are. And the third time, and then we're going to kind of move on from this concept, but the third time, well, okay, so, so we see Cahal right there, a nation and a company of nations. So that's Cahal as well. It's going to, the, the kings are going to come through the Cahal. The assembly, congregation, company. So then the third instance is this, Genesis 48, 4. Yaakov is dying. Jacob is dying and he's telling this story to to Yosef. And he's going to pass this blessing now on to uh, Yosef's children. Does anybody remember their name? Yep, Ephraim and Manasseh. Well, what does he do? You guys remember the story, right? He goes to bless the, the kids, the children. They might have been older, I don't know. But yeah, he, he purposefully, but also, I believe, prophetically switches hands. Okay, okay. So he goes on to tell Yosef, and, and Yosef's like, what? You know, he gets upset. And he's like, no, it should be. And he goes and reaches in for his hands and tries to switch him back. And, he, and uh, Israel says, no, no. Ephraim, who is, who, uh, uh, is, is the, uh, you know, the one that got switched, right? He said he will also be a multitude of nations. So we just learned that Cahal is a, is a multitude of nations, right? Well, so he says, no, no, no. He's also going to become a multitude of nations, but this time it's a little different. This one, this one doesn't say Cahal. This one says uh, mellow, like in magnitude. So like big or great. But mellow goyim. So a multitude of Gentiles. Gentile nations. And that's the difference between Cahal and, and Malo, right? So one is, one is uh, sort of rooted in, in, I guess, I would say maybe uh, like God's blessing in a sense, and the other one is, is outside of that. It's, it's for, uh, it, it came through someone that was essentially disobedient, right? But also it was great. Um, but what I wanted to point out here is this is really interesting. God spoke something 
to Jacob, Israel, and then he passed it on to his children. So write this down and put a couple of asterisks by it. Star it, underline it, exclamation point, parentheses, bold it if you can. Fathers, are you passing blessings to your children? Are you physically laying your hand on their head and speaking a blessing over them? We could talk, uh, and many of you have done this, so I'm not just saying this from a, you know, a judgmental. This is not judgmental at all. This is, this, this is something you can do. You can take this and you can do this, and you can bring life into your children by blessing them. Put your hands on them. This is what we do every Shabbat, right? And I don't have kids, but when we had our, our nephews, we did that. We, we tried to speak blessing over them. Because it establishes something. It also passes the, the, the DNA, if you will, of the blessing that God has given you and spoken to you. So for some of you, this is a chance to start a new cycle. Because some of you didn't, didn't have a good childhood. Some of you didn't get blessed by your parents. Right? That's okay. Because God can speak to you. Just like God spoke to um, Yaakov, right? So, in order to pass that though, you have to be whole. You have to find wholeness. You have to, you have to realize who you are, that you are in a kingly line. You, you got to realize that this promise is for you. Be fruitful and multiply. You be, you're, you are the owner of the land of Canaan. You, you know, you're the possessor of, the, of where you put your foot. And his blessings apply to you, right? Take that, pass that on. And Jim has, has a couple of stories that are really neat. Uh, uh, even from, from random guests that come over for Erev Shabbat meals, right? And you speak blessing to them as if, you know, obviously spirit-led, but you spoke blessings to them um, and they just begin to weep and break down because no one has done that before. It changes your life. There's a, there are entire ministries revolving just around um, going back and speaking blessing over people who never got the blessing before. Craig Hill, yeah. If you want to look up Craig Hill, we, we've had him um, you know, as guest speaker at places before. Amazing. But you see people with release in the spirit realm, release in their physical life because of the blessing that was spoke, even in proxy. Yeah. Yeah, so there's literally a manual you can use. Uh, she just said uh, Craig Hill has a, a book called The Power of Blessing. And, and I think I actually do have that. I, I read that in the past, but... That's a great point. So look that up and see how you can physically do what, what he's doing to you, Ephraim and Manasseh here. So we've been talking about assembly. All these things sort of come from assembly, come from, to, from this kahal concept, okay? So what I want to do now is transition to the New Testament or the renewed covenant. It's actually not new, it's renewed. Um, let's look at... at um, just some points that we all know, but I want to bring them up in the context of Kahal. So John 17, 22, and 23. John 22, or 17, 22, and 23. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them. This is Yeshua talking to his Father. That they may be one, just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity. Why? So that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. So as we investigate togetherness, it has to have this unity in the Spirit. There has to be unity. I would venture to say that if someone was causing disunity, we would probably get rid of you. <laughs> we would probably get rid of that person. 
Because this is so precious. Why? What's at stake? Not this relationship. Not my relationship with uh, David and Christina. The world's perception of Yeshua is at stake if we don't have unity. Again, can we manufacture this? I don't think so. I think it stems from the Spirit. I think there's a spirit of unity that we have to be aware of. But we also have to be aware of the enemy's tactics because he wants to rip that out. He wants to tear out uh, and divide so that the world looks and says, oh no, Yeshua isn't real. God really didn't send him. So we have to guard unity with everything that we have. So really what we're saying here is unity is a weapon against the enemy. Unity. So what can we do? We can recognize when the enemy steps in and there's, we can recognize when there's disunity. We can recognize when there's division, right? We can, we can be aware that that's something that the enemy is trying to, to pull against us. And then we call it out. Recognize and call it out. It's something that you can physically do. And you can physically, you can literally stand for unity. You can, you can accept nothing less than unity. And I'm not saying, what I'm, what I'm not saying is that you have to agree on every point. What I'm saying is, even though we disagree, I'm not leaving. You know what looks like that, that we're all used to? Family, right? Family, families stay unified. Oh, that's my, my brother or whatever. He's, he's off doing whatever, but you still call him your brother. You don't ostracize him from the family, right? And you continue to pray for him because you want him to come back. You want him to be... Uh, you know, part of the family again. Well, I, to me, that's unity. That's, we don't agree with whatever you're doing. I don't agree with you, but I'm not leaving you. I'm sticking by your side. So I think that's part of this. Unity is a weapon against the enemy. Let's, let's jump to Matthew 5, verse 14. You guys know what this story is? Yep. This is the city on a hill. You are a light. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. So let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So one of the things I, th I thought here in this concept of togetherness is a city is not just some lone ranger out in the plain. A city has a wall around it. There's protection. A city has a multitude of people together. I'll loosely use the word kahal, Right? They're together, and because of that, they can shine a greater light than they can individually. Like, he's saying that literally a city on a hill you can see for miles. He's re I think he's referring to Jerusalem here, but that's the model he's using. So when you have unity and you're together, you can have a greater impact and you can shine a greater light than if you were just out on your own. So what does this mean? When you go to pray for somebody in the uh, nursing home, take someone with you. It's really that simple. You know, a lot of times I think we think that the scriptures are so, uh, you know, hard to understand. They're not. Just take somebody with you. Um, when you go out, if you go out witnessing or you go out serving um, food to, you know, the homeless or whatever, take somebody with you. It's that easy. And I... Your, your light will be multiplied. Your impact will be multiplied. The kingdom will be spread out. 
I'm not saying you can't do it on your own, but I'm saying, like, think about the possibilities of doing things together, right? And then, what's the effect of this? If, if we actually have an effective city on a hill, what, what comes from that? People will see the good works and they'll glorify Him. So we don't unify just for our own good. We unify again so that people will see that He sent Yeshua and that His works are good and they will glorify Him because of that. The greater light we shine, the more people are going to see Yahweh. Amen? I don't know. You guys are really quiet. This was supposed to be interactive, so yeah, Mike, hit me. Let's make it interactive. Yeah. It's looking for the opportunity to speak about the Lord to those who are around. So you said there's a guy across the street, we walk outside. We can either look at that person as an opportunity, or we can just get into our cars and go back home. But if we're looking for opportunity, we're spreading the gospel and expanding the kingdom. And and by looking for the opportunity, it shows that we believe that God is using us, that God has a plan. Right. So just for uh, folks online, Mike was just saying when we were saved earlier on, we had this passion and this fire really to share, and we were looking for opportunities to, to witness everywhere. And so, so being aware of those things now as a, say, maybe a more seasoned believer, don't walk away from those things. Those things are still there. Those opportunities are still there. Yeah. Yeah. And I would, I would add um, that we pray that we would be stirred in our spirit to do that. Because if you manufacture that, people will see right through it. You're just trying to, you know, check mark or another notch on the belt. And we can't be that way. This has to be a spirit, natural, spiritual outcropping or a fruit of what's inside. It'll be fruitless if it's... Yep, it'll be fruitless if it's from us. It'll be fruitful if it's from Him. That's good. That's good. The first love we're supposed to return to. Amen. Amen. Yeah, we might pass the mic. <laughs> Not you. I didn't want it, Here, that to be wanna... missed. Come over so okay, people sure. can hear, see you. I didn't want that to be missed, and I didn't want any of these others because what Mike George is sharing and what you're sharing is re- really powerful, and uh, and it's really difficult to co- try to convey that. But I was thinking of what what's uh, what's the clincher to all of this? Like, what is the practical application? Like, what in the world drives you? And I didn't realize it until I was listening to Jephthah uh, when he was doing the blessing. And, uh, and he shared a testimony, but what he shared was all about being grateful, uh, actually appreciating yeah. what yeah. God has done for you. You know how awesome it is to serve somebody when you really appreciate it? And, and the blessing that comes from that is so powerful because even Balaam, his descendants fall into the line of Judah, inevitably yeah. into the line of Mashiach. How does that happen? He was, he was part of the tribe of people that would, God said would never enter the kingdom. Matter of fact, even uh, Mordecai, let's get it more personal. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mordecai, well, the reason, let's just be real, real clear. When Balaam says what he says, and he's, he's asked to curse Israel, and, he's, and, uh, and what does he end up saying instead? Twice he blesses Israel, and then he gives the key to the Messiah will one day come from these people. How right. good and how lovely right. are your tents, O Jacob? How, how beautiful are your dwelling places, O Israel? I mean, wow. And all of a sudden, God is, I have no choice, but I will bless that man. And because of that one act, I mean, who knows what happens to Balaam, but his descendants... And then it's no different with Mordechai, uh, not Mordechai, but uh, Haman. What's uh, yeah. the nickname they give him in the Hebrew? They say uh, Mordechai, or not Mordechai, Haman the Hagagi. And what is that a reference to, to the king of Og? Yeah. That's where he comes from. Yep. And if you want to know where, why, why is he connected to the king of Og, well, it's because when, um, when, when God was telling, uh, oh my gosh, to Saul, King Saul, Saul destroys everyone but King Og. 
And the Midrash, and, and that goes even further to say the reason he lets him go and the reason he takes the king, he actually let his pregnant wife leave because he had pity on that whole scenario and he let her leave even though God was like, you need to wipe out every single one of these. Not a single thing remains. And so, that, so the, so the uh, child gets to be born, and all of a sudden, we're seeing the entire scenario all over again yeah. in the life of Esther. And I hope you guys are aware of this in the life of Esther because we just celebrated Purim. Yep. But um, who do we see? We see the descendant of Og, king of Og, sworn to be wiped out by Almighty God. And you see who uh, Esther and Mordechai, who are, they, who are they descendants from? The tribe of Benjamin. Holy smokes, how is this happening all over again? <laughs> the, entire, the entire thing is here we got Benjamin and, uh, and, and Og all over again. And Haman, which he should be so grateful for the fact that God's people didn't wipe him out. He comes back and he says, you know what? Haman is blessed so much, so blessed. And he's like, I have all these things. I have, I have my women, I have my children, I have riches, and I have wealth, and all of these other things. And he goes, but I don't have that Jew, that freaking Jew Mordechai. Yeah. Not only will I wipe him out, but every single person who comes from that people. And if anything, Haman should have been saying, yeah, I'll wipe them all out, but I'll spare Haman. But he does just the opposite. And the point of this all is, is the same thing that Yeshua, our master, is wanting. God will bless you immensely for that kind of gratefulness. That's the same kind of gratefulness that Ruth was blessed with. And we know that Mashiach comes from her. But it's the same thing that uh, our Yeshua, our master, you were almost referencing to it, that Yeshua, our, ma- our master, was referencing to when he said uh, to Shimon Kepha, he said, mm-hmm. Shimon Kepha, do you love me? And he <laughs> says... Uh, he says, he is, Ken Adoni, of course, yes, I love you, my Lord. And he asked him three times, and everybody says, oh, it's because he, he denied him three times. But that, that wouldn't have been like Yeshua, our master, at all, because that would have been, it would have been um, unforgiving at that point. So it wasn't like that. What he's asking him is, are you grateful? Yeah. How grateful, how appreciative are you? Are you really? Are you really appreciative of what's been done for you, Shimon Kepha? And, uh, and it was that third time where it really struck him, and he realized what Yeshua was asking, and he made sure from that, that point on that Shimon lives a life that is yeah. so appreciative, and that is the blessing. When you're appreciative, you can run out to somebody who's standing out there who has no business talking to you, but you can reach out to him because you are so appreciative of what's been done for you. And it's no different for me and my wife when I, and I had that affair years ago. Um, that woman forgive, not only just forgave me, but made our relationship became better. And I don't know how to explain that, but I am very appreciative, and I would never turn my back on my wife, and I would never turn my back on my master who did that great work in her and in our marriage. So uh, appreciative. That's the initiating factor. That's what, that's what um, that's Yiftach that's was making the point of, is that <laughs> it's all about being appreciative and really being grateful for the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. I love interaction. It's good. All right, that's going to fall. No, that's very, very good. Very good. And that was, that's what makes it a hall. Yeah. That's what yeah. I kept thinking the enemy really doesn't want us to be Kahal at all. He doesn't want us to be unified at all. You know, he might not be able to take take apart the kingdom, um, but he might be able to take apart friends. He might be able to tear apart a marriage. And in so doing, sort of eroding the foundation of the kingdom. Like, unity has to be in, in everything, all along the way, every, every step. Families, you know, uh, I know uh, I was going to say John 10.10 10 comes to steal, kill, and destroy, right? Comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He does not want this kingdom thing to, to spread out. He does not want it to expand. He wants us to uh, hide things and conceal things so that we'd be cut off from the camp. He, want, he wants you outside the camp. 
So kind of going back to what we were seeing earlier, are we going to let the enemy win? Especially if you know the chess movie is going to play. Are we going to let the enemy win? Let's read, uh, you got something? Yeah, here. No, you're fine. You're probably going to read the scripture I was going to read. Maybe not. Nope. (laughs) (laughs) No, but I was just thinking as you were talking there, I was thinking about the prayer of Jabez. Oh, yeah. From 1 Chronicles 4. Yeah. And, um, come on, it's only two verses, and my phone won't flip. There it is. And he said, Jabez called on God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed, enlarge my border, and may your hand be with me, and may you keep me from evil, that I may not cause pain. And God granted him that which he requested. And I just kind of thought about it as so often in, in Christian churches, it's all about a physical blessing. But, you know, when yeah. you were talking, it just came to my mind. It's like spiritual. It's so much more, you know, yeah. to enlarge his borders. And that's really what you're talking about is to yes. enlarge our borders yes. beyond. You know, it's not, it doesn't stop at the parking lot. We go beyond. So anyway, yeah. I just thought that added in there. And that, yeah, and I mean, that's a great prayer to pray mm-hmm. um, as a body, yeah. And as, you know, as a family. And uh, I guess when you talked about blessing, I was just going to mention this real quick because you said I had a oh, yeah. couple things. One of them was <clears throat> when I first came into Torah, I was still leading a Bible study with the uh, Baptist church. And we had, and Mike, Mike went to it as well. And uh, we had about 10 guys there, I guess. And we had, we had always, even before we came into Torah, we always blessed our children anyway. We always did that because uh, that's what the Bible said to do. So um, when we had this Bible study, there were men there. There were people, uh, I don't know, in their 20s. And then we had two guys that were both in their 70s at that time. This is about six, seven years ago. And then listening to Craig Hill about blessing your, you know, if, even if your father didn't bless um, you. So we did it one night. And this was kind of expanding my border and just to encourage mm-hmm. you because it doesn't matter because people want that. You know, when you ask somebody to pray for them, they're, they're not going to say no most of the time. And so I had these two guys that were in their 70s, Jim and Aaron, and um, I said, and I taught about blessing that night, and then I said, I would like to stand in proxy for your father, which their fathers had been passed away for quite some time. And so I prayed over these two people, blessings of, you will do this, you do mm-hmm. this, you will please me well, you have done, you know, all these things. And these two guys that have been in the Baptist church for 50 plus years broke down and wept, and it wow. was just amazing. And, um, yeah. in fact, I saw one of them, I saw both of them actually at a wedding probably about a month ago. And, you know, we hadn't seen each other in a few years. And the first thing I do is run up, just give me this big hug, you know, cause it affected their life. It wasn't yeah. me. It was the father speaking through me, you know, so I guess be willing to expand your borders. Yeah. And, and, and right there, the kingdom expanded. There's freedom, joy, shalom, you know, and they can pass that on as well. Yeah, definitely. It's, this isn't about passing and growing your kingdom. This is about growing his kingdom. Yeah, being a vessel. It's great. So, okay, let's jump to Hebrews 10, uh, verse 19 through 25. Actually, I'm going to start at 22. Uh, no, I'll read the whole thing. <clears throat> Therefore, brethren, since we have a confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Yeshua, By a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil, which is his flesh. And since we have a great high priest, a great priest over the house of of God. Now, here's here's the thing. Let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. Having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil uh, conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider, this is the key that I want us to listen to here, and let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So he's telling us through this 
this last piece, I mean, it's all good, and there's a lot of encouragement there for any believer. But the, the part I want to talk about is stimulate one another to, good, to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together. The closer the end day comes, the more united we need to be. And I'm not saying the more Shabbats you need to come to. I'm not saying uh, just that. I'm saying more from like a spiritual perspective that we need to be assembling, we need to be kahaling, we need to be togethering. <laughs> uh, and the word assembling there is it's referring to synagogue, so essentially is talking about Shabbat, but Don't forsake being together. Especially as that day draws, draws near. We need more and more of each other. Um, you know, Ecclesiastes, two are better than one, right? Chapter four. Because they have a good return for their labor. For if either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there's not another to lift him up. Furthermore, if two lie down together, they keep warm. And how can one be warm alone? And if one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him, and a cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. Together. Together. So what does this mean, like, really? Like, what kind of impact do, we, do you want to have in your life? What kind of, what kind of vision do you have for for what your life's legacy is going to be. I think this is something that we all could, you know, spend some time, write down some, some concepts, but do we want to have an impact in the political system? Do we want to have an impact on abortion, on the abortion issue? Do we want to have an impact on human trafficking? Do we? Do we want to have an impact on the homeless community? What I'm suggesting is we can do more than we think we can if we do it together. And a lot of times, this was a topic of conversation that Laura and I had, a lot of times everyone's waiting for one person to stand up and say, this is what we're doing. And then everyone can kind of unify around that. And I just, I'm going to be open and upfront with you guys. Two thoughts. Number one, I don't think it always has to be that way. I think God's stirring inside of you. I mean, Mike, my goodness, you're so passionate about the abortion issue. You should be leading that charge. And we need to be supporting that. Unified, together making an impact greater than we could make on our own. The other thought is, I should do a better job of, of pointing to this is what we're doing. And I'll speak for the board and everyone, whatever, you know, our, our, our leadership team, that we should do a better job of pointing to that's what we're doing. This is what we're about. So we have to ask your for forgiveness for that. But we will do a better job at that. But I want to hear from you guys too. You guys have so much potential for impacting this world. Even if it's not a big issue, maybe it's just helping your neighbor because their tree fell down on a fence or something. Hey, I can get a couple of guys from my church to come over and we can, you know, whatever. And then what's going to happen? You're going to talk about life. You're probably going to talk about church. You're probably going to talk about the kingdom. You might get a chance to pray. There's a lot at stake, right? But we can unify and we can impact this world. Politics, business. It takes, it takes resources to do ministry, and no one would argue that. Who's the giver of wealth? He is. Who's the giver of dreams? He is. Who's the giver of good things? He is. So if we want to pass those on, we're going to have to get, have to get them his way. We need to do business with each other. And I'm serious. I, it sounded like a joke earlier, but if someone needs a ride or if someone needs their fence or, or patio pressure wash, you had better talk to Jim. I am being absolutely 100% serious. Because 
If we can bless Jim with our business, that means he can be a blessing to someone else. That means that he's going to tithe back into where? Here. That means we collectively are going to be able to reach out and, and help someone with their rent payment. It all ties in. And there's a bigger concept. Kahal is big. Kahal is completely overarching. Like, it, should be, it should mean that the kingdom is, is literally drenching every aspect of your life. 100%. It should be in everything that you do. Kingdom, kingdom minded. Everything. Every conversation you have has an opportunity to be kingdom minded, has an opportunity to draw someone to Kahal. And I'm telling you, we, when we talked about this, you cannot manufacture this. We have to pray that God stirs this up in us. And if you're there and you're saying, okay, well, I'm, this is already me, then pray that it's increased. Pray the prayer of, of Jabez. Pray that the, the borders would be expanded. Because what happens to the kingdom if we don't spread out? What happens to the kingdom if everyone here stops having kids? I'll tell you what happens. The kingdom dies with the last generation. That's what ultimately happens. We have to spread out. We have to be fruitful. We have to multiply if we're going to take the kingdom with us, if we're going to advance it. End of story. And, you know, to get a little bit in everyone's face, if that's not you, that's okay. But don't drag people down that are trying to do that either. We have, we have a, a, you probably heard this saying, I'd rather run with one than drag 20. Because you'll go nowhere with, if you're dragging 20. But at least if you're running with one, you can multiply your efforts. And, and uh, again, this is not meant to be judgmental, but we all have something, I have something a little bit more to give. I've withheld. And, I've done things with bad attitudes sometimes, <laughs> you know? So I've gotten worried. I've had anxiety, like all these things, right? But my point is we all have something, something that we can bring to the table. We all have um, a passion. We've all had an opportunity or had a moment, and I hope you've had a moment. If you hadn't, we'll do that after, but... We've all hopefully had a moment when God said, this is what your life is about. This is the promise I've given you. This is the blessing I've, I've spoken over you. Run with that. Run with it. Like, you know, get unstuck from the mud and let's go. <laughs> you know? Um, so, so what is he asking you? What? What are some things? And I don't, if you want to say something, just blurt something out right now. What is he speaking to you? What is something you're passionate about that, that is kingdom-minded? Hosting events, great. <laughs> Father figure, awesome. Prayer, amazing. We got another prayer warrior here too. Helping people, encouraging people, giving to missions, Encouraging people, praying over people, resourcing people, connecting people, healing hands, encouragement, encouragement, teaching, support, genius engineered mind person, <laughs> also encourager. All right, so you guys didn't have to say it, but I said it for you. People. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's great. Everything that we just said revolves around people. All right, let's do this. Um, let's just all gather up here real quick. So, so I really want you guys to take this with you. Like, I want this. You know, we talk every every week. Like, oh, I hope this message sticks with people. I want you to be thinking that 
everything that you do, the possibilities that exist are a lot greater if we can do it in unity and if we can if we can do things as a community there's there's so much more that we haven't tapped into and we're going to Shalom everyone, I'm Matt with Freedom Hill Community and on behalf of everyone here, I want to say thank you for joining with us each week. Um, it really means a lot to, to know that you're out there, that you're praying with us and that you're supporting what we're doing. Feel free to subscribe here on YouTube and turn on the notifications, otherwise you won't know when we're live. And also, you know, find us on Facebook and Twitter and all those other things. Uh, thanks again for joining us. Uh, Shabbat Shalom and we hope to see you next week.